Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Champion Forest. If you're a guest with us today, we are so excited that you're here. Our team would be honored to connect with you and answer any questions that you might have. You can go to championforest.org forward slash guest to fill out a short form just letting us know that you're with us or simply text your name to the number on the screen. We're about to get the service started, but before we do, we wanted to take a few minutes to let you know about some important announcements. Can you feel it? Christmas is in the air. Okay, maybe not so much, but Champion Forest Christmas Spectacular is back. After having to cancel last year's show, we are beyond thrilled to be back in action this Christmas season with a completely reimagined 90 minute, no intermission show that is sure to inspire, surprise, and bless you and your family. Tickets go on sale this Wednesday. So put a reminder on your phone right now to be sure and go online to get your tickets. Once again, that's this Wednesday at championforest.org forward slash Christmas. Our hearts are so invested in the country of Haiti. Over the years, CFBC has built a school, a food storage facility, and planted a church there. We've sent Christmas care packages, and over a thousand of you are currently sponsoring a Haitian child. We wanted to let you know that all of our buildings were thankfully spared from the recent earthquake, and all of the children are safe. But now, the country is in the middle of a food crisis. We're now working with our ministry partner, New Missions, to help get food to families in need, and we're able to do it because of your giving. In addition to the situation in Haiti, the unrest continues to mount in Afghanistan. Refugee organizations are preparing to receive hundreds of refugees, and again, because of your generosity, we are able to partner with the resettlement effort. These refugees will arrive in Houston with little more than the clothes on their backs, and we are working to supply them with everything that they'll need to start a new life here. This is an awesome opportunity to be the church and to show the love of Christ. If you want to know more about our efforts to help the people of Haiti and Afghanistan, contact the missions office. Thank you for being faithful in your giving. Because of it, the church is able to make an eternal impact all over the world. To give today, just go to championforest.org forward slash give. Once you're there, it's very easy to set up reoccurring giving, which really helps us to stay consistent in our generosity. Or you can give using the envelopes located in the back of the seats on each row and drop it in the offering basket when it comes by a little bit later in the service. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, let's join our hearts together and worship.
has he done something great for you? Baptist Church. We are excited to have you with us this morning. If you're a guest, I hope you'll take just a second and text your name to the number that's on the screen. Just a way for us to get to know you, you to get to know us. We have a couple of, of folks with us here this morning. I was going to call them guests, but really they're just coming home. Hey, everybody, right over here I have the great Austin Neal back with us. <laughs> excited to have him. And over here to my left and your right, we have Taranda Green back with us this morning. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why we have them back with us. Uh, about two years ago, we began working on a new project. And uh, our, our worship ministry uh, creates music and distributes music. And, and we have resources for you to worship at home. You can find them on Spotify and different places like that. But we started working on a new project. And it was right in the middle of a, of a really rough time for us. Really, uh, the last year has been, has been super hard for everybody. And we started thinking, what can we say with this project? What do we want to say with these songs? And we came across John 10, 10, and it says, the devil comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but Jesus comes to bring life, and not just life, but Jesus comes to bring abundant life. And so we wanted to communicate that through these songs. And so we're gonna sing for you the title track. I would ask you to sit and listen, but I don't think you're gonna be able to sit down. So I'm gonna ask you to just remain standing. And we wanna sing you this title track, and it just says, all of those things that the devil meant for evil, God has used for good in our lives. And that's the story of my life, the way God has turned our mess into our message. And we just want to declare this and celebrate the fact that we have a God who redeems and restores and all of the things meant for evil. When we allow him, when we allow God's redemptive process in our life, he wants to use those things for good. So I'm going to ask you to listen and then join in and sing with us. I think you're going to like this. Thank you. 
Um, hey, welcome to Champion Forest Tabernacle this morning, all right? Uh, that's really good, and I'm just telling you, if you're a guest to Champion Forest or maybe new here, if you don't have coffee before this 1045 service, we're going to wake you up. And uh, isn't that good to see our choir just getting after it in Taranda? Great to have you back, Austin, as well. I was telling Taranda, I was telling Taranda backstage, I said, why don't you just move to Houston and be an artist in residence? You can be here, you can worship with us every week. If you got to go travel, do your thing. Don't you want to get her back here to Houston? I say just move here. Um, I'm working it. I'm working it, all right? I'm working it. Go ahead and be seated, and uh, I want to just welcome you to services today at Champion Forest. My name is Jarrett Stevens, and I have the privilege of serving as the pastor here. And if I haven't met you, I certainly want to, and uh, just grateful for you to be here. And I want to add my welcome to that of Brent's earlier. Uh, we're just, we know there are so many great churches around here for you to visit, for you to come to Champion Forest. It just means the world, and uh, we're really, really grateful. Uh, I do want us to just... Uh, pray for a minute. Uh, so much going on in our nation. Uh, we think about uh, Afghanistan and just the 13 service members uh, whose lives were lost this week. I can't imagine the hurt, the pain, uh, the sense of loss that these families are going through. And I, I just want us to pause at the outset and pray for the God of all comfort uh, to be with them. We've got Hurricane Ida, of course, coming across the Gulf Coast and pressing in on New Orleans. And uh, we know about hurricanes around here in Houston this week. It's the four-year anniversary of Harvey, uh, the 16-year anniversary of Katrina. And so, uh, so many that we know have had to evacuate. My brother's family out of New Orleans had to evacuate. My sister's family, uh, they had to evacuate. They're staying with us. And uh, we just need to pray uh, for uh, God to be near. You know, the scripture says that he is Lord over the wind and the waves. And uh, we take comfort in that. And so I want us to pause at the outset and uh, just pray. Ask God's presence to be here. You know, I have no idea what you walk in here with. It may be just internally a hurricane in your world, a relationship issue, a financial struggle. Uh, no idea what you're walking through. But we want you to know you came to the right place. And we're going to uh, be preaching a message of hope today from God's Word. And we wanted to just pause right now and pray. And as we're doing that, men, I want to invite you to take your places as we pray for the morning offering, I want to thank you for giving. When you give to the work of this church, uh, you give to missions ministry. And so our missions ministry uh, right now has ears to the ground. And we are standing ready to help anybody in need, any church in need. And so it's your faithful giving that allows us to support uh, people that are hurting. And so I want us to pray. And then we'll take the offering, continue uh, to worship. This next song is Your Great Name. And there's so much about the name of Jesus. And so we pray in his name. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is in the great name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, that we bow our hearts before you right now. And Lord, we thank you that in Christ we can take back everything that the devil has stolen. And Lord, we sing this song out of a, out of a heart of victory, knowing that it's nothing in and of ourselves but, Lord, it's only because of you that we can stand and sing with grateful hearts. It's only because of you that we can stand and lift holy hands. And so, Lord, we worship you this morning. Lord, our giving is an act of worship to you. Our engaging with the Scripture in just a moment as it's preached is an act of worship. And, Lord, we just want you to be honored by what takes place in this room today. Lord, we pray for our military. We pray for the situation in Afghanistan, for those that lost loved ones this week, heroes who are putting their life on the line for our freedoms, to help people. God, would you minister your grace and your mercy and your presence to these families right now who are grieving? Lord, I pray that you would comfort them as only the Holy Spirit can comfort them. And God, for those on the Gulf Coast, Jesus, we do know that you are sovereign. You do control the wind and the waves. And Lord, as this storm bears down on people all over the Gulf Coast, I pray that, Lord, where there's anxious hearts, people would just turn to you. Lord, that we would hope in you, that we would trust in you. I pray for protection over people, over property. Uh, Lord, we just ask uh, that you would be a refuge in this time. Thank you for scripture that tells us, Lord, your name is a refuge, a strong tower, 
And God, we worship you in the name that is above every name. The name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.
from the pit. And God, we just declare with one corporate voice this morning that we believe with all we have in us that you are the one, the only way to life. You're the one, the only way to redemption and restoration. And God, we just praise you in this place, in this moment. We thank you that you have made a way. We love you. We celebrate you your goodness, we celebrate your graciousness, we celebrate your forgiveness, we celebrate your redemption, we celebrate your character, we celebrate the fact that you have chosen to, to love us in spite of us. Church, let's just sing that chorus one more time. Let's just make it our prayer. Just, just keep our eyes closed. If you wanna lift your hands and just say, God, thank you for making a way. But let's just end this worship time by singing that chorus one more time. Trying to lead us, let's just sing it again. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Um, telling you, that was good worship, and uh, we could just call it a day uh, right after that, but I prepared a sermon that I really want to preach, and so I want to invite you to take God's Word and turn to Acts chapter 2, 
And I do want to remind you, as you get in your car after church, and uh, you're sitting in the parking lot, <laughs> waiting to get out of here, I want you to remember how good it was this morning, all right? Let that bring you back. Acts chapter 2, we are in week 2 of our forward series, and uh, I am so excited about the message today. I'm calling the message Choices. And I encourage you to follow along with us, take notes, engage with us as we go, write in your Bibles, uh, just a good way to follow along. You can look back at it in your time alone with the Lord uh, during the week. In fact, uh, we are putting up every week now, I believe it goes up on Monday or Tuesday, the manuscript that I preach from up here uh, goes online. And so if you've missed any of the messages, uh, you can go, you can listen to the messages, you can either download our app. And uh, listen to it while you're on the road or working out, doing whatever it is that you do. Or you can go online to our messages and right there on the website uh, we have all of these messages, again, manuscripted out for you. And so you can listen, follow along, take notes. We just want to maybe help you grow in your spiritual walk. Uh, choices is the name of the title today. And you and I, you know this, we make choices every single day. Many of them seemingly insignificant. Like I'm sure this morning I'm trusting that you made the decision, that you made the choice to brush your teeth before you got here. Okay? That would be a good choice to make. Or uh, you made the choice to eat breakfast of some kind, and it was a choice that you made. You made the choice to listen to music while you were getting ready, or to watch news on the television, or to watch nothing at all. You made the choice. You made the choice uh, to get here today, to attend a life group, and then to come uh, to worship. You made a choice. You're making a choice right now that you're going to engage with the Scripture, that you're going to follow along, that you're going to take notes and pay attention, or you're making a choice uh, to scroll on your phone and check social media and see what's going on. We make choices every single day. In fact, I read an article this week, researchers at Cornell University found that the average person in the United States makes around 35,000 what they call remotely conscious decisions every single day. Decisions like we just talked about. You don't really even have to think about them. And out of the 35,000 remotely conscious choices that we make, I don't know how they came to this number, but 226.7 of them have to do with food. <laughs> what are you going to eat? Where are you going to go? Some of you are having that choice. It's going through your mind right now. Where am I going? Uh, when we're out of here, you're going to make that choice. These are just remotely conscious choices. This doesn't count the significant choices that we make in life. Choices like where you will go to college or who you will marry. Choices like how many kids will I have? What job will I take? When will I retire? We make choices all the time. And the choices we make in life, they ultimately define us. It's been said that our character is the sum total of the choices that we make in life. You can say it like this if you put it personally. My choices make me. In this passage that we're looking at today here, Acts chapter 2, we're going to see three choices that people make. And they are defining choices for the ones who made them. And we're going to outline the text, 41 verses so it's a lot. We're going to outline this text around three choices that are made. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get after it. I want, you to, I want us to begin by noting for the first choice that was made. The disciples chose obedience. Now I want you to remember the context that we're talking about here, Acts chapter 2. Picks up where we left off last week, Acts chapter 1, and that was the ascension of Jesus. Jesus was physically resurrected from the dead, and the Bible says that he stayed around the disciples for 40 days. He was teaching them, he was eating with them, he was spending time alone with them, and then after 40 days, he ascends back to the Father. But before he ascends back into heaven, he gives them some orders. We called it last week a mandate. You can read about it there in verses 4 and 5 of Acts chapter 1. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so the point that we're emphasizing is this. The disciples made the choice in this point, to obey Jesus. They did what Jesus commanded them to do. Rather than going out and running their own play, rather with 
pure motives, going out and trying to do their own thing, thinking their way is better. Instead, they choose obedience. They stay in Jerusalem. The Bible even tells us, verses 12 through 14 of Acts chapter 1, they return to Jerusalem. And look at verse 14. All the disciples, they're there in the upper room. We're going to go to Israel in 2022. We're going to get details up on our website very soon. And we'll go to where tradition says this happened, the upper room. And it's amazing to be there with our group. And we'll teach this passage of scripture. We'll worship there together. It's a trip of a lifetime. Be looking for details December of next year. But they're in the upper room. And what are they doing? Look at verse 14. All of these with one accord. We're devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. You're going to see this as a recurring theme in these early chapters of Acts. The believers were together. You're going to see one of the reasons that they could move forward in power, even from infancy stages, is because there was a priority on gathering together. There is a purpose in the church doing what we're doing right now, gathering together. There is blessing in it. There is value in it. There is power in it. This is good that we gather together like this. One of the uh, real disappointing, destructive parts of COVID has been the damage that it has done in cutting off believers from gathering together. It's real damage, and uh, it's a real threat. We understand that. That's why we're always going to offer our services online. And for those of you that are at home watching, ill watching, we want you to do that. If you're traveling, we want you to stay engaged with what we're doing. Always going to put these messages online. I'm just making the point today, though, that just as the threat of COVID is real, so too is the threat of not gathering together. We need to be gathering together more and more in these days, not less and less. Again, there's power in it. And I like to say, if you're staying at home for health reasons, that's good. But if you're staying at home for habit reasons, that's bad. And so the church, they would get together, not just together physically, but notice what they were doing. They were together in purpose and on mission. They were praying together, devoting themselves, verse 14 says, to prayer. On September the 15th, you're going to hear me talk about this a lot more in the days ahead. I just I felt since the beginning of God calling me here to Champion Forest that I wanted to, God was bringing me here to help build on the prayer culture that's always been here. And so on September the 15th, it's a Wednesday night, we're going to have our English service and our Spanish service combined on a Wednesday night service for the sole purpose to pray. We're going to call the church to pray more and more in small groups, in little groups. I, I've, you know, every week I've been here, I've been here for eight months now, I find something new, right? I mean, there's a lot of rooms in this church, and I'm walking around. And a few weeks ago, uh, I was walking around with some guys, and, and they said, let's go in here. And it was the prayer room. I didn't even know we had it. And uh, 24-hour access, if you have the code, I mean, there's a reason God has blessed this church from its early days. A room dedicated to prayer. And we're going to go in that room and fix it up a little bit. Make it a real intercessory room. And so I just want to tell you, we're going to pray more and more in these days. Gathered as the church. Small groups, large groups, everything in between. Prayer is what the disciples were doing when the Holy Spirit comes here in Acts chapter 2. And I want you to remember what we're emphasizing. It's the disciples' obedience to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And we pick up in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says this, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. You see it there again. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there's a lot in these few verses right here, and I just want to walk through them by answering the questions, who, what, when, where, how, and why. Very quickly, let's start with when. Notice when this takes place. The Bible says the day of Pentecost. Where Pentecost means 50th. It's no mistake uh, that this takes place during Pentecost. 50 days after the Sabbath of Passover. I want you to know God, when he's in control, he does nothing, and he is in control, by the way. He does nothing by happenstance. When God 
purposes something, he accomplishes it. And Pentecost, also known as the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest, it was one of the three main festivals where Jews from all over would come to Jerusalem and celebrate this feast. It was a day of thanksgiving early on. It was a day to present your grain offering to the Lord. And you were really in gratitude expressing your thanksgiving for how God had provided for you as the Feast of the Harvest. Later after the temple period, it was used to celebrate the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. So I want you to get what's going on here in Acts chapter 2. Notice the wind. No mistake here that the Holy Spirit, He comes on the exact day that thousands and thousands of Jews from all over the world are in Jerusalem. They are expressing gratitude to God. They are remembering God giving the law to them. And on that very day, God gives them his Holy Spirit. Amazing. That's the when. Notice the where. They, the Bible says they are gathered together. Chapter 1 said an upper room. Chapter 2, where we just read, said they were in a house. We don't know exactly where they were, but it had to be close Probably to the temple because the masses in just a moment when Peter begins to preach will gather around them. And so they're praying and all of a sudden they hear a noise. It's earth, wind, and fire, baby. <laughs> Tongues of fire, the Bible says, appears to rest on them. Who is them? Let's answer the who question. Well, we know it's the disciples for sure. Could have been the 120 that chapter 1, verse 15 mentions about 120 following Jesus. They all could have been there. But we know it was the disciples. And what is going on? The Holy Spirit comes and the Bible says tongues of fire. Fire represented the very presence of God. Wind comes. It's a noise like wind, the Bible says. Wind represented the power of God. And what we see in this moment is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ being birthed what's going on in that upper room what's taking place in that home where these disciples are gathered it's really more than anything a labor and delivery room for the church now I've been in a few labor and delivery rooms okay I know some of you uh, some of our senior adults they didn't let you in the labor and delivery room when your kids were being born I don't know why they let us in the labor and delivery room but they do you got to go in there. I've been in there, okay? And there's a calm before the storm, let me tell you. Now, for me, there's a storm before the calm before the storm because when my first daughter was born and my wife says, Jarrett, my water broke, I passed out. True story, all right? <laughs> Can't be springing that kind of information on me, all right? <laughs> True story. She said, Jarrett, get, wake up, get yourself together and drive me to the hospital. All right. Um, when our twins came... She was giving birth to the twins. I was giving birth to some kidney stones. So she's in one hospital room. I'm in the other, all right? Um, my wife loves telling me, telling these stories, all right, because she, she just loves the sympathy that it creates for me, let me tell you, okay? Oh, you had a hard day. Let me tell you, okay? That's... But there is, in the labor and delivery room, a calm before the storm. Uh, you're in there, and everything's going well. And then when it's time, I mean, it's like a NASCAR pit crew comes in. I mean, it was... And then they're out, thinking, what on earth? Your whole life just changed in a matter of a few minutes, and everybody's out of there. Um, I picture the birth of the church here in Acts chapter 2. It's the labor and delivery room. I mean, it, there was a calm. People are praying. One heart, one mind. And then the storm. G. Campbell Morgan, pastor of Westminster Chapel in London in the late 1900s, early 1900s, he said this, there was born the Christian church. Not by the sprinkling of water, not by votes and resolutions, not by creeds formulated and signed, but by the baptism of the wind and fire of God. What's taking place here is a very fulfillment of Scripture. You remember Acts is volume 2. Volume 1 is Luke, Luke's gospel. He writes both of them. In his first gospel, volume 1, he tells us the story of John the Baptist talking to the disciples. In Luke chapter 3, verse 16 John the Baptist answers and says, I baptize you with water. 
but he who is mightier than I is coming. Jesus is on the way. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that's what's taking place. Jesus is sending his Holy Spirit and he is baptizing them in fire. Now how is all of this happening? Let's look at the how question. It is a supernatural move of God. And that's made evident by verse 4. They begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there is no reason to go off the deep end when we talk about tongues right here. Because in this context, because of the word usage, we know that these tongues, they are no, none other than recognizable languages that were spoken by the Jews that were gathered from all over the world and in Jerusalem that day. In fact, look at verse 5. The scripture says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Again, nothing's happenstance here. God's brought them here. They're here to celebrate the Feast of Harvest, Pentecost. And at the sound, this multitude came together and they were bewildered, amazed, confused. Because each one from all of these different nations was hearing them speak in his own language. Known languages of the day. And they were amazed and astonished saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? I mean, those from Galilee, they were considered, they were considered backwoods. The disciples, they were fishermen. Tax collectors, blue collar for the most part. They weren't sophisticated like the Jews in Jerusalem. And so the people hearing them, seeing them, I mean, they were shocked by it. I mean, some of you, you're like, he's from Louisiana. How can he preach like that? Like, it's shocking, right? <laughs> now, just imagine if I was speaking in German. Then you'd really be blown away. So these untrained, unschooled men... Speaking in known languages of the day, they say, how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? If there was ever a miracle, this is one. And the people are amazed by it, astonished by it. They're at a loss of words for what they're experiencing in this moment. Here are these Jews from all over the known world. In fact, I brought this map for you. Just look at it. And as you look at this map, I'm going to read verse 9 to you. And you'll see where all of these Jews came from. Parthians. That's modern day Iran. From the Persian Empire, there were Jews that came back to Jerusalem and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia. That's modern-day Iraq, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia. What we know of today is the modern-day uh, country of Turkey, Egypt, parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. They came from as far as North Africa. You had visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans, that's from Greece. Arabians. Are you kidding me? All of these people from all over the world. Again, nothing happened on accident. God ordaining all of this. And look at the why question. Why did it happen at this moment in time? Why did it happen just like this? Look at the second part of verse 11 in Acts chapter 2. The Bible says this. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. This is happening because God is coming through on a promise that he made. And we read it just last week. This is an already not yet fulfillment of prophecy that we read about here in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 said, You will be my witnesses, remember, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And right now we see that here in Acts chapter 2 already being fulfilled. They are being his witnesses as they testify to the mighty works of God to known languages all over the world. It's already fulfilled, but there's a not yet because you and I still have the responsibility to fulfill this prophecy by being witnesses in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. It's beautiful what we see taking place here. One commentary I read had an interesting perspective. They noted that the Holy Spirit didn't distribute pens at Pentecost, but distributed tongues. In other words, the gospel was meant to be proclaimed to the world with our mouths. I mean, I hear it all the time, and it's true. We need to be a witness with our life. Yes. But if we're to be a witness for Jesus, that means we also have to be a witness with our lips. We open up, we proclaim the mighty works of God. Now remember the big picture here. This is all happening 
Because the disciples, trace it back, made the decision, made the choice to obey Jesus, go back to Jerusalem, and wait on the Holy Spirit. I shudder to think what would have happened if they didn't make that choice. Our choices matter. They can define us. They can guide us. They do matter. These disciples chose to obey. Secondly, we see Peter, the de facto leader of the group, make a choice. I want you to see that Peter chose courage. Holy Spirit falls. The disciples are speaking in languages from all over the known world. And look at this response when these people come together and hear these languages. Look at verse 12 and 13. And all were amazed and perplexed. It's interesting. You study Luke's vocabulary that he uses in volume 1, his gospel with Acts. He uses these words astonished, uh, uh, perplexed, to talk about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus would do things and the crowds would be astonished. And he uses the same exact language here in Acts talking about the disciples and their ministry. They were astonished. Saying to one another, what does this mean? But look at verse 13. But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. Translation, these people are drunk. I mean, they are are off their rocker. They had one too many. And they laugh at them. Some of them. Mock them, jeer them. But look at verse 14, the first part. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Peter addresses the crowd. The same Peter that 50 days ago denied he ever even knew Jesus. This same Peter, after the resurrection, who was hiding out in fear of being seen by those in and around Jerusalem. This Peter stands up. And speaks to a crowd of people who just 50 days earlier, because they would have been there for Passover, were crying out, crucify. This Peter makes the decision to stand up. He chooses courage and he speaks out. He could have cowered in fear. He had the influence where he could have said to the disciples, hey, let the Spirit do what it's going to do. We're done here. He could have said, John, you take this one. But instead... Peter doesn't do any of those things. He chooses courage, and not only does he set the record straight, but he preaches with a boldness that I'm not even sure he knew that he had. Look at verse 15. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. He says, come on, this is 9 o'clock in the morning. These people aren't drunk. This ain't no distilled spirits. This is the Holy Spirit, baby. This This is happening. And he preaches. He spits fire here. I'm telling you, I don't have time to go through The entire message that Peter preaches. Read it this week. I mean, he preaches a powerful message. But they say that all sermons done well should be able to be preached in a sentence. And so I've done my best to read and study the sermon this week and put it in a sentence uh, so that it can just encapsulate us and, and we can go through this at a little bit faster rate. Now, at the outset, let me say this. Before Peter preaches his message... He tells the people, hey, they're not drunk. This is, this is a fulfillment of Scripture. God said in the last days that he would pour out his Holy Spirit. And so what he tells the people is this is a fulfillment of Scripture. In the last days, the consummation of history, it, the clock starts ticking right now. And it's still ticking today. And we're a lot closer to the consummation of history today than we were when Peter stands up to preach all those years ago. But he didn't know that. He says, the last day... Clock's ticking. And then he preaches this message, and here's the sermon in a sentence. You ready? Put it on the screen for you. God sent Jesus, as Scripture predicted, and you rejected and killed him. But because he's God's holy one, he was raised from the dead and is now exalted at the right hand of God. Now, it's a run-on sentence, but it is a sentence, okay? (laughs) I want you to put yourself in the place of the Jews that were there that day observing, listening to the mighty works of God in their own language, hearing Peter preach this message. Again, they were there. 
They were there 50 days ago. They know who Jesus is. They know that he's been put to death. They also know their Old Testament. They know the law. They know the prophecy. And Peter begins to explain to them exactly what went on. Can you imagine in that moment when the scales fall off? When they are enlightened for the first time, what they must have felt, we killed the Holy One of God and He is now raised from the dead and sits at His right hand. And they've observed it. They've witnessed it. They know these disciples aren't fabricating this. Look at what happens. Look at their response. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? This crowd was gathered. They heard this powerful, scripture-saturated, Christ-centered, spirit-filled message. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart. They were pierced. They were stabbed. Some of your Bible said uh, they were deeply convicted. And by the way, this is, this is what kind of preaching we should long for, okay? We should long for preaching that is saturated with Scripture. Centered on Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. And if that ever stops here, you need to get rid of the preacher or go find a new church. I mean, maybe we listen and want and long messages that are saturated with God's word, centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. This kind of preaching accomplishes Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, the purpose for which it's sent. We ought to want it, long for it, and thank God for it. What we read here, Taking place, people cut to the heart. It's, a, it's exactly what Jesus said would happen when the Holy Spirit comes. We looked at it last week, John chapter 16. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And that is exactly what is taking place, and they feel it. There is a weight. And they say, what must we do? What can we do? And that's like throwing a softball to Peter. Peter says, I'll tell you what you can do. Look at verses 38 through 40. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. He says, you want to be saved? Repent and be baptized. Now, Peter's not preaching some works-based theology here. He knows that salvation is something only God can do. It is by faith in Christ alone, by grace alone. But how do you know you're walking in that grace? Peter says you must be willing to repent. A word that means to have a change of mind. Leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. You are walking your own way, doing your own thing, but God calls you to Himself and you make the choice to turn and repent. Turn and go the other direction. And He says, You must be baptized. Verse 38, that word baptized, it means to be immersed, to submerge. It's, a, it's your identification as a believer. This is how you know, this is how the world knows you're a follower of Jesus. You identify with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection through water baptism. If you want to know what the first step of obedience is as a follower of Jesus Christ, we're talking about making the choice to obey. It is to get in those waters over there and be biblically baptized all the way under and all the way back up. That's just how they did it in the Bible. It's how we do it as a Baptist church. It's interesting, I was talking to a buddy of mine this week who loves the languages, and he was, we were just talking about this verse, and he said, you know, both these verses are in the imperative. This is not a suggestion. It's instruction, it's a command. He says, repent. And the word repent, it's not just in its imperative, it's in its active imperative tense, meaning something only you can do. That's why Peter says, each one of you. You can't, mom and dad can't repent for you, teenager. Moms and dads, your children or your spouse can't repent for you. It's something that each one of you make a choice to do. You turn from your sin and you start walking with the Lord. It's active imperative. Baptism is passive imperative. It means something, 
someone does that to you, you don't baptize yourself. That's why Jesus said, go into the world, make disciples, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what is Peter saying? He says, if you want to know what steps to take now that the Holy Spirit has convicted you, you need to repent and be baptized. This shows a change of direction and an identification that you are now following Jesus. So we see a choice. The disciples choose obedience. Peter chooses courage. But we see one more choice that's made that day, and that's the choice of the crowd. And the crowd chose faith. Not all of them, of course, but a whole lot of them. Look at verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Each person listening that day had a choice to make. They could receive the word and be saved, or they could reject it and go on living their own life, doing their own thing out of fellowship and relationship with the God who created them and loved them. And the Bible says 3,000 that day got baptized. Listen, at the end of this service here in a few minutes, we're going to baptize three. In our Spanish service, we're going to baptize four. And I'm having a good day just because we're baptizing seven, all right? I'm thrilled. We gave the invitation. We gave the, And baptism, man, it matters. It matters. I was just telling our staff this week. Uh, in 2017, Champion Force, we had our largest number of baptisms ever at, at 577. That's 577 people whose lives have been changed by the power of the gospel, and they chose to identify with Jesus through baptism that they are now following him. He is the Lord of their life. 577 in 2017. Do you realize by the end of this month, we'll be at 450? God's moving. God's moving. And every one of them matter. Every one of them matter, but I'm just telling you, if I gave the invitation today and 3,000 of you come get baptized, I, that's mic drop. I'm retiring. I'm calling it a day, all right? That is amazing. 3,000 to be there that day and to see people make a choice that changes their eternal destiny forever. Mm. That's why the invitation is so important. Every week when we give that invitation, that's why I encourage you not to leave during the invitation. But be praying for the person on your right and your left in front of you, behind you. Because when we see someone come forward to either receive Christ or join the church or just to have prayer, what are we seeing? They're making the choice to go after God. And we need to celebrate that with them. So I I wrestle with this all week. How do I apply this, right? And I've got about two minutes to do it. Uh, So here's how I want to apply it. I want to apply it using the outline that we just preached. Here's the application. Number one is this. Choose obedience. I mean, how does this affect us today? Choose obedience. The disciples of Jesus, they had a choice to make whether they were going to obey Jesus. Go back to Jerusalem and wait. And they made the choice to obey. Well, as the, his disciples, we have the choice to obey every single day. I mean, he tells us in his word, abide in him. Walk in the spirit. Share your faith. Be a witness. Live on mission. Are you going to obey? Am I going to obey? We have that choice to make every single day. And let me tell you this. God always honors obedience. Always. Always. So choose obedience. Secondly, choose courage. We saw Peter could have remained silent. He could have sat that one out. But he didn't. He chose courage to speak up. And let me just tell you something. In our day, in a culture that is decaying, in a society that is continually to get worse and worse, not better and better, and Jesus said this would be the case, when we see Jesus misaligned, maligned or misrepresented, Are we going to have the courage, like Peter, to stand up and set the record straight about who Jesus is? When we see injustice taking place, something that happens in our society, at our work, that doesn't align with the holy character of God, are we going to turn a blind eye? Are we going to have courage and step up and say something? If our employer asks us to do something that is against the character of God, the fruit of the Spirit, are we just going to do it? We have a choice. Will we have courage? Students, teenagers, listen to me. You have a choice every single day when you walk into that school, when you're sitting in that locker room. Are you going to be a light for Christ? Are you going to open up your mouth and invite them to church with you? Or are you going to sit it out because of what they may think of you? I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage all of us. Let's be so filled with the Holy Spirit that it's not even a hard choice to make. And let's make the choice to have courage. And then third and finally, Choose faith. And this is the choice that some of you need to make today. You're here, watching online. It's no accident. God 
orchestrated and ordained it. And some of you know that you are outside of a personal relationship with the Lord. And you need to make the choice, just like that crowd did that day, to repent and be baptized. I've never met anybody who made that choice who regretted it. No one. And there's an urgency to it. You read verse 41. Peter continued to exhort them with many words saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. There's an urgency. Today is the day of salvation. And I'm telling you, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, it's cutting you. It's weighing on you. All that we're talking about today, that is the Holy Spirit of God. And you have a choice. And I want to encourage you to choose faith. And you can do it right now. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. It's the most sacred time in the service to me. After we have worshipped, after we have taught the scriptures, to give people an opportunity to make a choice. Some of you need to make a choice today to join our church. You've been visiting. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And when we begin to stand and sing, don't wait. Just come forward. We had somebody at our 8 o'clock service come forward today and join our church. Sign up for the members class where they can learn what it means to be a member. and Join. You can come forward today and join our church. Make that choice. Some of you need to make the choice for faith for the first time. God's spoken to your heart. You know the answer for you is not being a better person. It's not another relationship. It's not another step up the corporate ladder. None of that stuff's going to save you and answer the desire of your heart. What's going to answer the desire of your heart is being in a right relationship with God. And some of you need to choose Jesus today. You have that moment right now. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. If you want to choose Jesus, I'm going to encourage you to come forward and just tell the pastor, I'm choosing Jesus today. We'll take it from there. We're going to put resources in your hand, celebrate with you, answer any questions that you may have. Some of you need prayer. Man, you've looked up and you're a Christian, but you're not choosing obedience. You're doing your own thing. And I just want to encourage you, when you look up like this and notice that, it's not Jesus that's gone anywhere. We leave him. So what's the answer? You repent. You come back to him. Come forward. Tell the pastor, man, I, I want to get it right today. We'll pray with you. Again, answer any questions that you may have. Celebrate with you. I don't know what decision you need to make but I'm telling you choices define us and if God the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart about any of these things that we've talked about today make the choice by his grace And so Father in Jesus name this is your invitation and where you've spoken to hearts let us choose faith to respond in obedience to you it's in the name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said Amen and amen. As you look up, I'm going to ask you to stand up. The pastors of our church are going to be here and here and here and here in the balcony area. They're there at the exits. You don't have to come all the way down. But if you have a decision, as we begin singing right now, I want you to come. Don't wait on anyone. You come right now. Come on. Right now. Come on. Come on. Worthy is the I want you to come. That you want to join the church? I want you to come. Choosing Jesus, I want you to come. Come on. You came with someone, they'll come with you. Come on. God bless you. Anybody else? Yeah, we can celebrate. Anybody else? Keep coming. Come on. I've seen it. One act of obedience can encourage others. Keep coming. God bless you. Who else? God bless you. Who else? Anybody else? Come on. God bless you.
I'm praying. If you need to make a decision, you come. Maybe it's just this prayer is what needs to push you over the line of faith. Have you come join our church, our fellowship. We'd love to have you. If you need prayer, I want you to come as we pray right now. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these that we're celebrating new life with, for these that just need prayer. Lord, for these that are joining our church, we give you praise for what you're doing in this place. It's in the name that is above all name that we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Would you join me in celebrating what God's doing across this place today? All these decisions that are being made. Now, we got three baptisms, so I want to turn your attention to the baptistry and let's celebrate like crazy these who are identifying with Jesus and his church. Well, I'm excited to be celebrating with these. They'll be giving their testimony today in regard to baptism. This is Farah. Farah, are you coming today following Jesus in baptism because you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Because of your profession of faith, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You got it. And this is Belanca. I'm going to ask you the same thing, Belanca. Are you following Jesus right now in the waters of baptism because you've accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is Adelina. Adelina, have you, are you following right now Jesus Christ in baptism because you've accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried together in baptism and raised to walk in a new life. Amen. So good. So good. Chevy Forrest, thank you for being here today. Two things before you leave. Number one is... Christmas Spectacular is here, all right? And tickets go on sale. Tickets go on sale this week, September 1st. So go to our website, championforce.org, to get your tickets there. Also, I talked about Afghanistan earlier. We have an incredible military ministry uh, where we provide gifts for the troops. We pray for them, just support for them. Uh, in our main hallway there, we have a wall of honor. And I'm so grateful uh, that we have a church that honors our military and the service that they put forward. And if you want to be a part of this ministry, just go by there. There's a sheet of paper that you can pick up, needs that you can help fulfill uh, for our uh, soldiers. And so, uh, did we do the, we did the offering. I need to make sure. We did the offering. We can do it again, all right? We can do it again. I'm looking at my notes here. All right, y'all are awesome. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.